All right, welcome everybody to the debate. And the question of the debate and the title is, did the distinct person of the divine son pre-exist? We're going to have our two debaters. I'm going to introduce them to you in a minute. Before that, I want to do a couple of administrative remarks. Um, I'm going to do a few of those. I'm going to ask Pastor Mark to come up and open us in prayer. Once he does that, I'm going to come back and then read the bios of our debaters, and then the debate will begin. So first, just a couple of administrative remarks. First, please do what I did. Take your cell phones, phones, silence them. This is being recorded, and we don't want uh, sounds, et cetera, on, on the recordings. Um, this is it's scheduled for two hours, and we are pushing it right up to the minute to two hours. There will be no breaks in this debate. And those so of you that have attended debates, sometimes there's a break. On this one, there is not. So uh, facilities are, the, the women's room is right outside of the door here to my right, and the men's room is outside the door to my left there. Um, so let's, without further ado, Pastor Mark is going to open us up in prayer. Then I'm going to come back and read the Bibles, and we'll start the debate. As we get uh, ready to begin, let me bow our heads in prayer. We, before you, Father God, we thank you but from your throne of grace, Father God, that we are able to be here this evening, Father God, uh, at this time, and I ask of your presence, of your revelation, of your guidance, and that everything that we do, we give you honor and we give you glory. Uh, we love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> I do want to make sure I introduce myself to you. I'm going to be the debate moderator tonight. My name is Jim Baber. So what our, our format is going to be, we're going to start out with a 20-minute opening for each. We're going to have an eight-minute rebuttal for each of our debaters. Then we're going to have an eight-minute cross-examination, and, and then an eight-minute closing for each of our debaters. And then, we're going to, then we're going to end in prayer for the night. So I want to introduce our, our, our first debater here, who's going to start us off here in a minute, which is Steve Ritchie. Pastor Ritchie became an elder in 1993 and was ordained as a pastor in 1996. Pastor Ritchie has written many books and articles on what is theology, creationism, archaeology, Bible prophecy, and Christian discipleship, as well as many books and articles against Roman Catholicism, Islam, Arianism, Unitarian Socianism, and other false religions. Pastor Ritchie is currently the director of Global Impacts Ministries. Most of Pastor Ritchie's free books, articles, and videos are posted on the Global Impact Ministries website at apostolicchristianfaith.com. Our other debater is Dr. Eddie Delcor. He's the president and director of the Department of Christian Defense. He teaches apologetics and general theology at Harvest Bible University and serves as a mentor of theology at Greenwich School of Theology in London, England. Dr. Delcor holds a master's in apologetics and a PhD in theology from Northwest University. He's an international speaker, has been featured on many Christian and secular radio and television networks. Dr. Delcor is a theological contributor to various theological journals and publications. He has written numerous countercult, apologetic, and evangelical tracts and pamphlets, and he's authored several books on the topic of apologetics. So with that, we are going to start our first 20-minute opening with Pastor Rich. Thank you, everyone. It's good to be here tonight. I would just like to open by stating how grateful I am for Dr. Del Cor to invite me to this event and for Agape Christian Center for hosting this debate tonight. I truly believe that knowing the identity of Jesus Christ is very important. Jesus said in John 8, 24, unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that I am he, not we, you shall die in your sins. And then verse 27, the scripture says, they did not understand that Jesus was speaking to them about the Father. There's only one true God, the Father, Jesus said in John 17, 3. So it's my pleasure to be here tonight to defend the Word of God and to preach the whole counsel of God as the first century apostles did about 2,000 years ago. The topic for tonight's debate, uh, Dr. Delcor gave me two uh, possible titles for the debate in which he said something like, uh, did the Son of God or the person of the Son pre-exist? 
Well, oneness believers, we all affirm that the person of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, preexisted as the mighty God and eternal Father before he became the child born and son given, according to Isaiah 9, 6. And so I couldn't accept those. Then he came up with a third one, which said, did the person of God the Son preexist? And uh, that was what, exactly what I copied and pasted from my email. Changed a little bit tonight, but basically the same idea. Did the person of God the Son preexist? Well, no. We, one as believers, affirm that the person of God the Son did not preexist as God the Son because there's no true God beside the only true God, the Father. Jesus said that there is only one true God when he prayed to his Father. There's only one heavenly Father. The Jews knew no other doctrine other than the one true God, the Father. And so tonight's debate is not about the person of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, pre-existing as the mighty God. Tonight's debate is focused on what divine person became incarnate as the man, Christ Jesus, because we both believe that God became a man. God became a son of God and son of man. We don't have a God the son of God and God the son of man. The son of man means the daughter or the, the, the son of the virgin daughter of a man. That's why they're post-incarnational titles, son of God, son of man. God the Father also became a man as a genuine human being. Prominent one of theologian Dr. Dave Bernard wrote in his article, The Mediator Between God and Man, and I quote, God himself came into this world as a human being. He didn't say God the Father came into this world as God the Father. God the Father came into this world as a human being. Hebrews 2.17 says, The God who partook of flesh and blood, who shared in our humanity, was made exactly like all human brethren are made, fully human. So Jesus, in order to be tempted of evil, had to pray to his God, or he would not have been a man at all. John 5.26 says, As the Father has life in himself, so has he granted, granted, didn't he? Granted the Son life in himself. We have the divine life outside the incarnation, which is immutable. God can't leave heaven, cease being God for a while to become a man. That's impossible. I am Yahweh, I change not. Malachi 3 6. So God became a man. The Holy Spirit came down from heaven. Jesus said, I came down from heaven. How did he come down from heaven? As the Spirit of God. That's why Paul wrote, The Lord is the Spirit in 2 Corinthians 3 17. So, one is theology believes that God, the Father himself, came into this world as a human being. Dr. Daniel Seagraves, another prominent one as author and theologian, wrote that everything that Jesus did and said, he did and said as who he was. God manifest as a genuine human being in genuine and full human existence. So everything that Jesus spoke, everything that Jesus prayed, he didn't speak out of a divine consciousness. He spoke out of a human consciousness because God became a human being. That's what one of Pentecostals believe. They're just like there's a lot of Trinitarians out there who, unfortunately, they don't know what they're talking about either. They say all kinds of crazy things. Same thing with some Trinitarian theologians. But sometimes one of Pentecostals say some crazy things too. But knowledgeable oneness of believers affirm that God became a man in the incarnation to the Virgin. The scriptural evidence proves that the Father alone is the only true God who created us. Isaiah 64, 8 clearly states that you are our Father. We are the clay. You are our potter, and we are all the works of your hands. Whose hands? You are our Father. We are all the works of your hands, the Father's hands. And again, Hebrews 2, 7, cites Psalm 8, 5, and 6, in which the scripture says that he, the Father, crowned the Son. Notice, the Father crowned the Son with glory and honor, and has appointed him, the Son, over the works of his hands. Whose hands? The Father's hands. Since Jesus Christ is appointed the ruler over the works of God, the Father's hands, the Son could not have created anything literally as the Son. It was in God's logos, in God's mind and planning, that the Father created all things in Christ, through Christ, and for Christ in God's mental conception. Like it says in the Talmud, Pensacum 54.8, it says that the Messiah was preconceived in God's thoughts. 1 Peter 1.20 says, the Messiah was foreknown, prognosco, known beforehand before the foundation of the world. Since the Son was foreknown beforehand, Jesus Christ could not have existed as a Son before being known beforehand. Otherwise, the language of foreknowing becomes meaningless. The titles God the Father, or similar designations, God even our Father, appears more than 30 times in the New Testament. But nowhere do we find the titles God the Son, God the Word, or God the Holy Ghost. Why? Because there's only one true God, the Father. God is our Father. 
We don't have a heavenly God, the Son, heavenly Holy Ghost. No, there's only one true God, the Father, and we see Jesus as the image of the invisible Father, Colossians 1.15. The Father possesses his own logos, just like a man possesses his own logos. The Thayer's definition of logos says that the logos is the thoughts of a person that are gathered together in one's mind and then expressed in words. So that's why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, for by your words, the Greek is logos, by your logos you will be justified. By your words, your logos, you will be condemned. Again, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 37, let your word, Greek is logos, let your logos, yes be yes and no be no. The Greek word logos appears more than 300 times in the New Testament. And every time it's used, it's not used of a person beside a person. It is used for the expressed thoughts of a person. Just like we have the ability to think and speak for ourselves, so God, on a much more transcendent level, can think and speak for himself with his own logos. Just as John 1, 1 states that the word was with God, pros, so the truth of the gospel was with the Galatian Christians, with pros, Galatians 2, 5 says that the truth of the gospel may stay with pros, you. So the truth of the gospel may stay pros with you. Now we know that the truth of the gospel is the message of the gospel. Likewise, the foreordained message of the gospel was with the Father, Lagos. The beginning was the word, Lagos. And the word, the Lagos, was with God, with God the Father. So it doesn't have to be a literal pre-incarnate living son, but the message. Titus 1-2 says the hope of eternal life was promised before the ages began. The human ages. God's attributes can be said to be with God and even call God just as Logos is in John 1-1. 1, 1. 1 John 4-8 says God is love. 1 John 1-5 says God is light and there's no darkness in him. The light of God, the love of God, are his attributes which are a part of his being. So the attributes of God can be said to be uh, with God, and even call God. God is light, God is love. Job 12, 34 says, with God is wisdom and strength. Counsel and understanding belongs to him. Notice, with God is wisdom and strength. Counsel and understanding belongs to him. God's attributes, his wisdom, his strength, his almightiness, his counsel, his understanding belongs to him, just like a man's attributes belongs to himself. So likewise, John 1, 1, the Logos belongs to God the Father. Jesus was the primary purpose for all of his creation. God predicated all his creation upon Jesus Christ as the firstborn of all creation, as the beginning of the creation of God, Revelation 3.14. God first chose Christ, his chosen servant, according to Isaiah 53.10. Then he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He chose us in him, Ephesians 1.4. He predestined us dia, through Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world. To be predestined through Jesus Christ means that we weren't literally created, but it was in God's logos and is expressed on his mind and planning before the world was created. Hallelujah. So God's attributes can be said to be with God and call God himself. Origins commentary of the Gospel of John, book 123, proves that the modalists were the general run of Christians in the early third century. And I'm quoting from Origin of Alexandria. He was speaking about the modalists when he said, the general run of Christians proceed differently and ask, what is the Son of God when called the Word? The Logos. They imagine him, the Son, to be the utterance of the Father deposited, as it were, in words. So Jesus, before he existed as a living Son, before he was granted life by the Father, John 5, 26, he was the utterance, the word of God the Father, uttered in words before the child born and the Son was given. This is precisely what we find in Messianic prophecies. We don't find a father-son relationship occurring until the New Testament. For example, Hebrews 1, 5, cites 2 Samuel 7, 14, in which God the Father said, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. Hard to imagine that God the Son being at the right hand of the Father in his presence. Well, the Father said, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. Proof positive right here. I could just go home tonight. <laughs> that the Son is the man who was born in Bethlehem because God became a man. God didn't become a God the Son. God has never been a God the Word or a God the Son person. Because the Lagos of a person is not a person. Jesus called the Lagos of God, not God the Lagos person. So, again, Hebrew, I wish I had more time. Jeremiah 23, 5, 6. God the Father said, I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign. Not the king that has always reigned as a God the Son, but Jesus shall reign as a king. 
and this is his name whereby he shall be called Yahweh. Notice, he shall be called Yahweh. If Jesus was a God the Son, a timeless God the Son, he should have been always called Yahweh. But Jesus was given the name which is above all names. Jesus prayed in John 17, Holy Father, keep them through your name, the name which you have given me. Jesus' name is the name of God the Father, which means Yahweh saves. So here we have it. Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us as a true human being. Hallelujah. I'm excited about this tonight. I love God's word. I have a passion for God's word. Uh, it's so truthful. Uh, the Trinitarian doctrine was developed by the Roman Catholic Church. There were no true Trinitarians in the first couple centuries of the Christian faith. They were semi-Aryan. They didn't believe that Jesus was fully God. Uh, Origen said in Contra Celsus 814 that the modalists were the general run of Christians, and they were the ones who were saying that Jesus is the most high God. And he said, we don't hold with them. We don't believe that Jesus is the most high God. Hippolytus and all these guys, and maybe my opponent might say, they didn't believe that Jesus was the most high God. They believed he was a semi-God, a lesser God, like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. But it was the early modalists, the oneness believers, who are saying that Jesus is the Savior is the most high God. Praise God. The Son of God is God the Father incarnate as a genuine human being. The angel spoke to the virgin in Luke 135. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, what reason? Because the Holy Spirit came down from heaven to become a man. For that reason, the child which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. He's not called the Son of God because he's always existed as a timeless God, the Son. He's the Son of God. Because the Holy Spirit came down from heaven to become a man. My opponent has the wrong God person that came down from heaven. Because he should have been a God of the Son. But the Holy Spirit came down from heaven. Again, the angels spoke to Joseph in Matthew 120. Joseph, son of David, fear not to take Mary as your wife. For the child which shall be conceived in her is ek, literally, out of the Holy Spirit. I challenge you to read Matthew 120. It says, the child which, who has been conceived in her is ek, out of the Holy Spirit, or from out of. Jesus said in John 16, 27, I came out from God, I came forth from the Father. Jesus also said in John 17, 8, when he's praying to the Father, I came out from you. Jesus came out from the substance of being of the Holy Spirit, Matthew 1, 20. But it says in John chapter 17, 8, that he came out from the Father. So we know the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, the Father who came down from heaven. God's Holy Spirit is called a Holy Spirit in his presence in action, like he hovered over the waters in the book of Genesis. So likewise, the Holy Spirit came down and hovered over the Virgin Mary, and from that Spirit was produced, ek, the Son of God, out of the Holy Spirit. And ek, out of Mary in Galatians 4.4. 4. Humanity from Mary, deity from the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 1.3 says, He, the Son, is the brightness of his, the context was the Father. He's the brightness of the Father's glory. He's the express image of his, the Father's person. Jesus is the image of the invisible God person as a human person because God became a man. That's why to see Jesus, to see the Father. So Hebrews 1.3 uses the Greek word character, which means a copy from an original. So Jesus is the copy of the substance being of God the Father, just like Colossians 1.15 says. You can't be a copy or reproduction from the substance being hypostasis of the Father and always exist as a timeless copy. Jesus had to have a beginning by his virgin beginning because he's a son. He's a man, just like you and I. He's so much human that we can be called his brethren. Romans 8, uh, verse 30 says that whom he predestined, he also called, justified, and glorified. And we are, according to Hebrews 2, 17, made like unto, Jesus is, made like unto his brethren. So Jesus' humanity is so fully human that he can, we can be called his brethren. He's not God with us as God. He's Emmanuel, God with us as a man. The scriptural evidence proves that the Son is a man who was granted life by the Father. Again, John 5.26, I challenge my opponent to respond. As the Father has life in himself, so has he granted, did me, granted the Son, Zoe, life in himself. God as God can't be granted life. The Son is the man who was granted life in himself. Jesus didn't pray out of a divine consciousness. He clearly prayed as a human being. Uh, John 5.30, Jesus said, I can do nothing by myself. 
That doesn't sound like a God consciousness. God the Son said, I can do nothing by myself. Jesus said in John 17, 16, 7, 16, my teaching is not my own. My teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. And again, John 8, 26, what I have heard from him, I tell the world. John 8, 28, I do nothing on my own. I do nothing on my own. I speak exactly what the Father has taught me. Jesus often prayed for help, saying, Father, save me from this hour. If Jesus was a God the Son praying from a God the Son consciousness, then he should have been able to save himself. Jesus prayed as an authentic, genuine human being, according to Dr. Bernard. Again, John 8, 42. I have not come on myself, but he sent me. Now, wait a second. Just like all human beings don't come in this world by themselves, in Jesus' human consciousness, he could say, I have not come on myself. Because in his human consciousness, that human spirit had a beginning. God granted life in himself to a genuine human being. Because God became a genuine human being. I'm not preaching Unitarian Socinianism. I'm saying God became a genuine man like us in order to save us. This explains the prayers of Jesus, the temptations of Jesus, and how Jesus was led up of the spirit like any prophet into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Jesus is not God with us as God being tempted. He's God with us as a man. Hallelujah. So the scriptures prove that there's one God, 1 Timothy 2, 5, who was our heavenly father, and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. You know, I don't care about my reputation. I call me a heretic, whatever you want. I don't care what organization you might belong to. But you know what's the most important thing, beloved? That we obey the word of God and believe that Jesus Christ is the I am he of Exodus 3.14 who came to save his people from their sins. He's not another God person, beloved. He's not another God person beside our only true God, the Father. Because Jesus said in John uh, 12, 44, 45, he that believes in me doesn't believe in me, but him who sent me. He who believes in me doesn't even believe me. He, talk, he didn't talk about himself as another God person. He said, he that believes in me, believes in the one who sent me. He who sees me, sees the one who sent me. John 14, 8, 9, when Philip asked, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus answered, have I been so long time with you, and have you not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. To see Jesus is to see the image of the invisible God, the Father. Not another God person, beloved. The earliest Christians believed that Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Hermes was a first century prophet in Rome. Hermes parable 5, 6 is the pre-existent Holy Spirit, which created all things that God made to dwell in the body of flesh chosen by himself. So the early Roman Christians in the first century believed that Jesus pre-existed as the Holy Spirit, just like Matthew 120, like Luke 135. Hermes parable 9, 1, first century. I want to show you, the angel said, what the Holy Spirit that spoke with you in the form of the church showed you. For that Holy Spirit is the Son of God. The Holy Spirit is the Son of God. Only one of those believers affirm that. Jehovah's Witness don't say it. Trinitarians don't say it. Arians don't say it. Unitarians and Sidians don't say it. Only one that believes that. Again, Clement of Rome wrote in the first century, guard the flesh that you may partake of the Holy Spirit. He who has dishonored the, the church shall not partake of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Christ. The Holy Spirit is Christ. Again, uh, Ignatius wrote, Magnesians 15.1, the inseparable spirit is Jesus Christ. This is the earliest Christians who were taught by the apostles. The inseparable spirit is the spirit of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, the Lord is the spirit. Six verses down, Paul said, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. He says, Christ Jesus the Lord, he is the spirit. According to 2 Corinthians 3.17, Colossians 1 says that we have Christ in us the hope of glory. Romans 8, 9 says the Holy Spirit wow. is the Spirit of Christ. God bless you all. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Delighted to be here, and I want to thank my Lord Jesus Christ, the eternal Son who saved me, who gave me to God the Father for redemption. And I pray that everyone who's sitting here and watching that's not redeemed, that's not regenerate, I pray the same prayer for them, that God the Father would give them to God the Son. Around 18, or, um, 318, Aries the heretic claimed, Hain pote hote uk ain. There was a time when the Son was not. In the 20th century, and you heard my appointment mention him, in the 20th century, David Bernard, who 
is agreed he's an authority on oneness doctrine. He's a prolific author. He said there's a time when the sun did not exist. The same kind of heresy. Thus, biblically, oneness theology has always been condemned in whatever form. Oneness theology is a heretical uh, Unitarian system that denies the vast context and content of the scripture. As you heard Mr. Ritchie explain, oneness doctrine reduces the pre-existence of the Son. It reduces the unipersonality to the Son and denies it to a plan, only a plan of the Father. And I'm glad that somebody quoted John 8, 24, if I can quote it accurately, though. Jesus, the Son of God, said, unless you believe, ego and me, I'm the eternal God, you will die in your sins. And that is what this debate is about. I'm not sure why he quoted patristic sources and all these other issues that's not relevant to this debate. I don't think it's fair to the audience who came for a debate on the preexistence of the person of the Son. My job tonight, my job tonight is to affirm the pre-existence and deity of the distinct person of the Son. My job tonight is to affirm not only his pre-existence, but to do this on the basis of the exegesis of the text. From my opponent, we heard nothing in the exegesis of the text. All we heard was a rattling of Bible passages. No exegesis at all. Although my opponent, Mr. Ritchie, has made a lot of false things as I see it in his blogs and on his videos and all these things. I, I see him as mis consistently misparsing <laughs> verbs and misapplying them and all these things. My job is not to refute him. I, I'm affirming something. That's not my job tonight to go back and look at every single thing that he has said in the past that as I see was inaccurate and refuted. That the hell take me all night. That, but that's not my job. My job is to affirm the biblical presentation of God the Son pre-existent, distinct from the Father. That's my job. Now, Mr. Ritchie's job is to refute me upon the basis that I present, is to refute the exegesis of the text. That's his job. We got our jobs lined up. We know we're, we're, we're supposed to know what we're doing here. Well, I'm going to do my job regardless of the irrelevancy of what's been presented so far. If the Son, simply put, because one thing we do agree on, both of us, we don't have a lot of time here. So I'll go right down to the nuts and bolts of the exegesis of very important texts. If the distinct person of the Son preexisted as God, then the question is, what would we expect to find in the New Testament and Old Testament? What would we expect to find? If he really was God the Son preexistent, second person of the Trinity, in a distinct relationship with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, what would we expect to find? Well, number one, we'd expect to find intimate fellowship and communicable activities between the Father and Son before he came to earth. Now, am I saying that we'll, we should expect this dialogue in King James English? And no, but we should see some kind of communicable activities. John 1.1, 1, 1, John 1.18, 1, and John 17.5 are my prime texts. There's many more, but because of time, these are the ones I'll deal with. John 1.1, 1, 1, in arche hain halagos kai halagos hain prastantheon. It's a beautiful text that's been written, that's been affirmed, I should say, by the early church. To do what? To show the gospel of the Son and who he is, that he's distinct from the Father. But let's look at these texts, because patristics, keep in mind, they're not a, it's not a valid hermeneutic, but it does give us some insight what the early church believed. But I won't really be going to patristics, because that's not the subject of this debate. John 1.1 1, 1 is a very important, important verse, and uh, syntactically, there's three clauses, A, B, and C. And I'll say at the onset, scholarship is on my side. It must be very difficult for a Jehovah's Witness or a Oneness Pentecostal or somebody else, a non-Trinitarian or someone who denies the deity of Christ, to do research, lots of research, 
and discover that these scholars were Trinitarian. Well, because of that, what you have, even by Muslims, you have a lot of people that do bits and piece quotations. A little bit here, a little, little piece here. That's not how you do research. Scholarship is on my side, as we'll see. In John 1, 1a, in the, um, in, in the beginning was the word. Hain is a per, in perfect tense. And one thing we know about the imperfect tense here. It's antecedent to the time of Arche, meaning this Lagos was existing before the Arche. That's what an imperfect tense does. That's the force of the imperfect tense. Now, in terms of the, the, the meaning of the Lagos, yes, there's vast meanings of the Lagos. However, when we look at the content of the prologue of John, that's where we derive the meaning. John puts personal attributes to the Lagos. In him was life. In him was life. And this life was the light of men. He was the creator of all things. Panta de auto agenita. The genitive of masculine pronouns used. He's the creator of all things. John the Baptist was a testimony to him. John the Baptist did not say, Behold, the plan of God that takes away the sins of the world. He didn't see the Lagos as the plan of God. The distinctions between the monogamous theos ha'on and the father are made so clear, particularly when you get down to verse 18. A coherent reading of the content of the prologue reveals a radical opposition to oneness doctrine, who views the logos as a mere plan or thought in the father's mind. Thayer says, uh, I know Mr. Ritchie quoted a bit of Thayer. Let me read you what he actually said on, in his lexicon, in Grimm's and Thayer's lexicon. Ha logos, the only applied to John 1.1. 1, 1. The logos denotes essential, the essential word of God, i.e., personal hypostatic wisdom. That's not how he represented Thayer. Thayer says personal hypostatic wisdom and power. Linsky says this, the logos is not an attribute inheriting in God, but a person in the presence of God. And I can go on and on with scholarship on this. Again, they're on my side, scholarship. John 1.1b, 1, and the word was prostantheon. You heard him mention about pros. But let's look at the actual prepositional phrase where pros is found in John 1.1. 1, 1. Not throw out a preposition and say, see, it means this. Now again, it says, halagas hein prostantheon. The imperfect verb is used. An ongoing past element there. That's the force of the imperfect verb. The Logos was always there, but he was prostantheon. Now, pros has many different meanings. However, unlike some of the other prepositions, whether it's uh, son, para, and pros can denote intimate fellowship. Romans 5.1. Therefore, having been justified from faith, we have, ekumen, we have peace. Prostantheon. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5 8, Paul says, absent from the body is prostan pet, uh, kirion, present with the Lord. Intimate fellowship. Here's the thing prostantheon, the prepositional phrase, is used 20 times in the New Testament. 20 times. And besides the three times where the neuter article is used, every single time it denotes persons. Persons. Every single time it denotes persons who are with Tontheon, with the God. John 1, 1, C. <clears throat> John 1, 1, C, and God, here's how it literally reads in the Greek, Theos, Hain, Halagos, God was the word. Now, grammatically here, you have the, the predicate nominative, the word for Theos. A predicate nominative, this preverbal and an arthrus here, first it's qualitative, not definite, the predicate nominative describes the class or category to which the subject, the logos, belongs. It's not identifying the logos, not John. He's not identifying the logos. If you really, if you really see grammar as important, John's not identifying the logos with the Father. It's a predicate nominative here. It's an arthrist. It's preverbal. It's just basic grammar 101, folks. Murray Harris. Let me quote John, 
uh, 118 first, my other passage. No one has ever seen God at any time except the monogamous theos ha'on, the only begotten or the one and only God who's always at the Father's bosom. Murray Harris says this about, the pa uh, about this passage, particularly dealing with the articular participle, which my opponent told me, or I read that, I had a ridiculous argument because I said it denotes timeless existence. Murray Harris, a New Testament scholar, he says this about ha'on in John 1.18. It denotes the son's eternal existence. It denotes the son's eternal existence. Robert Raymond said the present participle ha'on indicates a continuing state of being who's always in the bosom of the father. Vincent, ha'on, a timeless present expressing the inherent and eternal relationship of the Son and the Father. And I can go on and on. The ho'on, the, the, the ha'on is used also of the Son, of the Son in Romans 9, 5. We read, of whom is the Christ? Katasarka, according to the flesh. Ho'on uh, epipantone theos, who is always God overall. Christ in the flesh, Paul says, katasarka is always ha'on, epipantone. Theos, God overall. And there's other passages we can look at that have the same types of linguistic parallel to timeless existence. But here's the thing, with, ab and with absolute non-linguistic evidence, he denies because as he wrote in, I think it was uh, Reyes' video presentation, he wrote in his uh, rebuttal that he doesn't know of any translation that has timeless existence. Well, first of all, we don't judge the Greek text by it second-hand information. We go to the Greek text. That should be sufficient. And would that be um, consistent for us to say, well, John 8, 58 doesn't say I'm God. John 8, 24 doesn't say if you don't believe I'm God. It doesn't say I'm God. You go in me just as I am. Well, we don't judge the Greek text by an English translation. That's not what we do, friends. We look at the Greek. We look at the original. Let's look at John 17, 5, and I wish we had more time because these passages are important. Now glorify me together with yourself, or glorify me, Father. Dokasan ma su. Glorify me. Dokasan ma su. Glorify me, you, Father. That's how it reads. It's an arius imperative. What's an arius imperative? It stresses a commandment. A do it now kind of verb. Never is it used to something that's not a person. Never in the New Testament is the aorist imperative used that way, where it's just a plan or the mind of God. It's just not used that way. Glorify me together with yourself, a shared glory. Para with the dative is used twice, and grammatically, linguistically, para with the dative indicates a side by side or in the association or in the company with somebody else. Now, Para with the dative is used 10 times in John's literature. And every time, it denotes distinct persons and an object. Every single time. In fact, Thayer says, Thayer says this uh, of John 9, 1925, it's the only passage in the New Testament where para is joined with the dative of a thing, you know, the cross. Mary was standing by the cross. Other than that, he says, with all others, dative of person. And I would point out, there's no... Greek word linguistically equivalent to mind or plan in John 17, 5. Oneness, folks, they think the plan had glory in the Father's mind. Show me where that word appears. I know what the Jehovah's Witnesses at Colossians 1, 16 and 17, they add the word other. Well, what is Pentecostals add the, the whole concept of mind, even though there's no word. The Father had glory. When did the Father have this or when did Christ have glory with the Father? Pra, tu, tan, kasman, anai. Before the world was para, soy, with the Father. Hey, you, don't, you don't need the Greek. Just read in the English. It tells the whole story what Jesus was saying. What else would we expect to find? Well, along with passages that, that show intimate fellowship, communicable activities between the Father and Son before time, we'd also expect to find passages that show the Son was sent by somebody else, the Father. Many passages we can know, but I want to go to John 6, 38, uh, 638. Because syntactically and grammatically, it shows something very interesting. I wish I had more time. It starts off with a conjunction. You cannot say it means the Spirit here. You cannot change the identity from 37 to 38. 
Hate Catabebeca Apatu Urano. And now Jesus says, because I came down from heaven. I came down from heaven, not Hana, not to do my own will, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Grammatically here, you have an Arius participle, uh, Pemthantos, that's the Father sending. And then you have the perfect indicative, the main verb, uh, coming down to earth. Here's what we have there, friends. Grammatically and syntactically, you have the action. The action of the Father sending the Son before he came to earth. That means his action of not doing his own will was before the incarnation. And that's exactly what we believe here. What else would we expect to find? We'd expect to find places where Jesus Christ is the actual agent of creation. I'll elaborate on this shortly. Where he's presented as dia with the genitive. All things through him. To panta di alto. All things through him. Which in scholarly documentation and linguistic evidence shows that the son was actually the agent of creation. Not a mere instrument. That's not what it shows. This is grammatically supported by grammars and lexicons. The son was the actual agent in John 1.3, in Colossians 1.16 and 17, and also in Hebrews 1.2 and Hebrews 2.10, and John 1.10, dial with the genitive, denoting the son as the agent of creation. Lastly, what would we expect to find if the preexistent son uh, was deity and he was distinct from the Father. If this doctrine is true, what would we expect to find besides the things I mentioned? We'd expect to find that he was God. That he was God in the flesh, but he was God before the incarnation, distinct from the Father. Philippians 2, 6 through 11 and Hebrews 1, 3 through 10 demonstrate this exegetically. Not merely my philosophy, but exegetically. Philippians 2, 6 through 11 you have two verbs in verse 6. You have huparko on the present active participle, subsisting as God. You have agesita, did not consider equality with God a thing to be taken advantage of. And all the verbs that follow. Here's what we have grammatically. And it's incumbent on Mr. Ritchie to refute this. Here's what we have grammatically. The verb, the reflexive action of the verb, emptied himself. The alton ekonosin, emptied himself. And the participles that follow were subsequent to the two verbs in verse 6. So he was already God subsisting. And he considered something. Plans don't consider. He was God existing to the glory of God the Father, and he became flesh. That's what the passages are telling us. To the glory of God the Father. There's always a distinction. And lastly, in the prologue of Hebrews, I'll go to Hebrews 10. The Father, quoting from Psalms 102, Psalm 102 the, from the Septuagint, which is Psalm 101 actually. He says, you, Lord, emphatic position there, you, Lord, in the beginning, laid the foundations of the, of the earth and the heavens of the work of your hand. Who is the Lord in Psalm 102? It's Yahweh. How is God the Father addressing the Son? Not only is he saying, that, is he commanding, Aries imperative again, the angels to worship the Son in verse 6. How is it that the Father can command the angels to worship a human person? That's idolatry. Only that he's God, the angels can worship him. But in verse 10, the vocatives used. The vocatives used. Direct address. The father's directly addressing the son as the Yahweh of Psalm 102. Friends, it's incumbent on me to do my job. And it's incumbent on Mr. Ritchie to do his job and deal with the exegesis of the text, which we haven't seen so far. Thank you very much. Each. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Trying to hurry up on time. I got eight minutes. Oh Our 15-minute rebuttal is turning into eight minutes. I'll, I'm going to do my best. Praise God. Okay. Um, Dr. Delcor mentioned a few things. Uh, Hebrews 1 6. When he brings the firstborn into the world, he, God the Father, said, Let all the angels of God worship him. Now, if the angels were worshiping a God the Son throughout eternity past, then why would God the Father say, let all the angels of God worship him if they were already worshiping a God the Son in the first place? The only thing that would confuse the angels is that God became a real man. That's why the angels were commanded to worship the Son. 
when he brings the firstborn in the world, why is he called the firstborn? A God the firstborn before the incarnation? No. He's called the firstborn because he's the firstborn of all creation. Colossians 1.15, in the mind of God, which explains that in him, Greek preposition in, Colossians 1.16, all things were created. Now, if all things were literally created in him and dia through him, then why would all of the uh, thrones, lordships, rulers, and authorities have not been created in the Genesis act of creation. Because God clearly, in, in Colossians 1.15, spoke of the firstborn of all creation in God's mind, just like Revelation 3.14 calls Jesus the beginning of the creation of God. Now, Jehovah's Witnesses love that passage, but we don't believe that he was literally created. No, in God's preconceived thoughts, he was already created in his mind, just like a, an architect builds a blueprint. So likewise, God made a heavenly blueprint in which the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, Revelation 13, 8. Jesus wasn't literally slain twice, just like Jesus was not literally born twice. God calls the things as be not as if they already were. So since God calls the things, Romans 4, 17, that be not as if they already were, he could say that the Son was already born. The Son was already slain in his logos, in his mind and planning. That's what logos means, the thoughts of a person expressed in words. The hope of eternal life was promised before the world began. Titus 1, 2. So, she said in John 6, 38, I came down from heaven. Now, when Jesus said, I came down from heaven, he had already become a man. So, in his human consciousness, he could say, I came down from heaven with a divine awareness through revelation that he is Emmanuel, God with us as a man. Jesus didn't come out of his virgin mother speaking Jewish, Aramaic, and every other language of the world. He had to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So in the human consciousness of Jesus Christ, he could say through revelation that he came down from heaven because he is the Spirit of God. The Lord is the Spirit. Uh, I'm going to get into quite a few things here. Colossians 1.16. Didn't hear much about Dia in the genitive, I don't believe. But, uh, of course, examination comes up. Dia in the genitive is, can also be used of time during the course of time, according to Moulton. So, dia in the genitive is used in Colossians chapter 1, 15, 18, because Jesus was the firstborn. God first chose Christ as the chosen servant of Isaiah uh, 43, 10, 11. He chose Christ, and then he chose us in him before the world was created. That's what Jesus meant when he said, the glory which I had with you before the world was. Not that the glory was always had. It was given to him. Daniel 7, 14 says that and glory, dominion, glory, and a kingdom was given to the Messiah over all peoples, nations, and languages. That was given to the Messiah, to the anointed Christ, not to a God, the Son of Man. The Son of Man is an incarnational title. For lack of time, I'm going to move. Oops. Okay. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. Again, Moulton said it can be used of time. During the course of time. Since Hebrews 1 2 states that it is through Christ that the aeonus, not the physical worlds, aeonus means time periods. Dia in the genitive must refer to being used of time rather than being used of immediate agency. This strongly implies that God created the agents of time through Christ in his mind, in his logos, rather than literal agency. As I pointed out, I think in my opening, Hebrews 2 7 cites Psalm 8 5 and 6, in which God's word says, He, the Father, appointed the Son to rule over the works of his hands. The son didn't literally create everything as a son, but God used the son. According to David Menard, God predicated all of his creation upon his future son. Christ is the reason for all created things, and it was in Christ, Colossians 1.16. It was through Christ, within his mind and planning, God created all things through his chosen servant. He, he chose his chosen servant. We don't have a God the chosen servant. That's ridiculous. A God, the chosen servant, that's a prophecy of the man Christ Jesus because God would become a man in the fullness of time. So Hebrews 1, 2 has to be used not of immediate agency, but it strongly implies that God created the ages of time through Christ in his mind rather than literal agency. Now, we've got to remember, we're talking about a supernatural God. God calls the things as being not as though they were. The resurrection of Christ and the death of Christ were accomplished events in God's sight. Even the birth of Christ, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. We know that during the time of King David, who wrote the second psalm, we know that Jesus wasn't literally begotten, but God already considered an accomplished event. Okay, 
Hebrews 1, 8 through 12. Hebrews 1, 8, 9 is a quote from Psalm 45, 6 and 7, in which the psalmist gave a prophetic song about what the future inhabitants of the world would say to King Jesus when he sits on the throne of his glory. It's not God speaking to God here. Hebrews 1, 8 doesn't say he says. It's in italics. It says, but unto the Son, your throne of God, BLB, translation. But unto the Son, your throne of God. You love righteousness, hated wickedness, Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you. So Jesus prophetically is called God. He's going to sit on the throne of God, Revelation 22, 3. The throne of God and the Lamb is one throne. The Lamb will sit on that throne. So Hebrews 1, 10 is the same thing. Psalm 102. Uh, the psalmist prays, verse 24. Uh, oh, my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. For of old you laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens of the work of your hands. It was not God speaking to God in Hebrews 1, 8 through 12. It was Man speaking to either God in prayer or about the future Messiah. So, yes, Jesus created. He did pre-exist to create all things as God before he became a man. That's what Hebrews 1, 8 through 12 is talking about. John 1, 18. Ho'on, always. Well, the same Greek verb is used for Jesus, ho'on, remaining in Egypt until the death of Herod. But no one could say that Jesus was always in Egypt before the death of King Herod. That's ridiculous. So you've got to look at the whole Bible and find out some of these ridiculous ideas to try to support a trinity. What glory did Jesus have with the Father? John 17, 22 said, the glory which I have with you, hallelujah, the glory which I had with you, I've also given to them. The glory which you've given me, I have given to them, the disciples. John 17, 24 says that they may behold my glory which you have given me. Jesus was given, just like Daniel chapter 7, he was given dominion glory in God's prophetic mind and planning before he became a living son. Dr. Dolcor misquoted John 75, saying, the glory which I shared with you. But there's no Greek word for shared. The Greek verb literally means uh, had or held. So why would Greek scholars have translated ekon as had? He should have used the Greek words kononeo or meteko. But it's not there in the Greek text, so I don't know where he gets to interpolating the word, um, the glory which I shared with you before the foundation of the world. Philippians 2. Um, Dr. Del Coro alleged in Philippians 2.6 should be translated, who always existed. The Greek word always is not there. It's pontate that means always. It's not in the Greek text. Why did God did not use the Greek word pontate through the inspired writings of Paul in Philippians? If Paul meant always existing, then he would have used the Greek word. God bless you all. In Jesus' name. There's a lot of stuff to respond to. Um, first off, I would say still we have no exegetical interaction to anything I've said exegetically. It's interesting that he, he tried to comment on uh, John 17, 5 on the verb. Well, the verb's in imperfect tense. Why does Vincent, why does scholarship agree with me on this? It's an imperfect tense. Hey, Akan, that I had with you. He says, well, I don't, I don't see any word share. Well, read the Greek text then. It will help you. Para sel auto, read it. And how scholars look at the linguistic symbols of those words. I haven't responded to Hebrews 1.6 because I had another one. This person asked the same, actually made the same rebuttal. Why would God do this? I'm not interested in why. I know what the text says. It says he did it. Arius imperative. Worship the Son. And the Son had to be deity distinct from the Father. That's what he said, not why would he say it. Interesting, I just had a discussion with the Jehovah's Witness about firstborn. He makes the same error. Thinking that prototokos means uh, first in, in line or first created. That's not what it means. Show me a scholar that applies that meaning to a passage where it's applied to the Son. Show me one. Just one. In uh, Exodus 4.22, Israel's called firstborn. Would he apply that same meaning? He can't. David's called firstborn in the Septuagint, prototokos, the same word, in Psalm 89. And technically, David was what? The lastborn. Mr. Ritchie quoted... Earlier, uh, John 8, 24 in his opening statement, but again, that was the son speaking. In fact, right before that in 17 and 18, he quotes the Old Testament law of two persons. If my, he talks about his testimony indistinct from another person, the father who verifies him. It wouldn't be valid if you went to a Jewish court and says, my soul testifies for my spirit 
or for my mind. It's just not there. It's not going to happen. Earlier, he said, he, he commented on the son as the agent of creation. He's tried to comment on DL with the genitive. Show me one scholar that has that meaning to Colossians 1, 16 and 17. Show me one scholar or lexicon that gives that meaning or in, in the mind meaning, which the, the, none of those Greek words are there, in the mind. There's not one Greek word that's equivalent linguistically to in the mind in all of the passages that show Jesus the son was the creator it's not there you have to add it in if you had a translation you'd probably add it in like the watchtower as in other you would have to because it's not there it's just not there he's the agent of creation scholarships on my side I'm going to keep saying that he presents no scholarly reference to any ref uh, of, of anything that I said in refutation he, he quotes bits and pieces from Thayer, as I already refuted. That's not what Thayer said about the Lagos. He's still persisting in his view of the Lagos without any kind of scholarship. He quotes oneness people. His whole entire presentation so far is surrounded by oneness people. He talks about pros um, in his opening. Well, again, Mr. Ritchie, we're talking about prostantheon in John 1, 1. We're talking about it's used 20 times in the New Testament. We're talking about there's not one time, except where the neuter articles used, only three times, where it means something other than distinct persons or person who were with tantheon. That's what it means, persons. There's no, there's no verse that means in the mind. <coughs> The Logos belongs to the Father. I, what verse says that? He belong, I already, already refuted that in John 1.1c. 1, 1, it's a predicate nominative. It's an arthritis, preverbal predicate nominative that defines the essence, the nature of the Logos, not the identification of, not the identification of Tontheon. He's simply wrong from a basic grammatical standpoint. Most of his quote, most of his rebuttal and presentation, I'm, I'm somewhat befuddled because it, it really has no relevance on this topic. I gave uh, specific passages that indicate the son who is subsisting as God. He didn't deal with the lexicon, the lexical import of huparkon. I'm not sure if he knows the, the force of the present active participle in Philippians 2.6 because he never said anything about it. Why do we believe, why do scholars believe that the son was always existing as God? I can give you a list of scholars. Tonight, I mean, you can look at Google right now and look at the list of scholars that disagree with my opponent. Why? Because it's a present tense participle, morphe, the essential characteristics of God, and it's an arthritis. The quality of the son was God, and what happened? He emptied himself. It's a reflexive action there. The alton ekonosin, it was a self-emptying. The Father didn't empty him. The, uh, the Holy Spirit didn't empty him. He emptied himself. And what? Labon. A participle of means. How? By taking the very nature of a servant. Genomenos, being made in human likeness. Being found, the other part is being found in the appearance of a man. That's the gospel. That's the preexistence of the Son, who was always God. The context in Philippians is humility of Christ. That's the context. The humility of Christ, who before the incarnation, before the end sarcos, he was sharing glory. He had, as Vincent says, he possessed it, in perfect tense there. He in, uh, in, it, possessed the glory, pratutan kosmon, before the world was. There's no word for mine there. You've got to read into that stuff. Can't I just allow the text to read for itself? Would that be okay? All through scripture, you know, in John 6, nine times the Son is sent by the Father. Nine times in just chapter 6. Sent by the Father, ectu urano, or ex urano, or apatu urano. Nine times. Is that not sufficient? How many times do we got to read the Son was sent? Forty times, as mentioned, the Son claims himself that he was sent by the Father. There was no, there was no response to John 6.38. I want to hear a response to that exegetically where the Arius participle is antecedent to the perfect indicative, meaning the action, the poio, the action of the son doing his own will. I mean, doing the father's will and not his own will. That action and that action of, of um, the father communicating, sending, that action was before the incarnation. That's just basic grammar. I want to hear a response to the exegesis that I provided tonight. That's his job. My job is to affirm 
the preexistence of God the Son, which I have been doing. And I would appreciate a response, an exegetical response to what I presented. Thank you. succinct questions, do not make statements, and in your answers, please provide clear answers and not monologues. Okay, okay just give me a minute here. Uh, Dr. Delcor, Isaiah 64, 8 says, You are our father, we are the clay, you are our potter, and we are all the works of your hands. Based solely upon the inspired text of Isaiah 64, 8, you talk about exegeting texts, what divine person created mankind by the works of his hands? Was it the father's hands or was it the son's hands who created mankind according to Isaiah 64, 8? You are our father. Well, first of all, when you say, when we, we see the word father in the, the Old Testament, we have to understand, number one, is that the whole concept of father and son was not a normative concept in the Old Testament. So to say that they were really familiar with the, the concept of the father and son is, um, is just completely incorrect. And in fact, the usage of father normally denoted God as creator. Deuteronomy 32, 36, Exodus 64, 8, Malachi 2, 10. God as creators, it's always the father as creator. He's a father in the sense of his parental role. There's no idea. In fact, show me a Greek scholar or show me a, a biblical scholar that would have that idea of this, this kind of modalistic spin on the word father there. Um, so, no, that's not how we interpret the word father there. And in fact, when we look at the doctrine of the Trinity, you asked about creation, when we look at the doctrine of the Trinity, that's exactly what we find. We find that the father was the ultimate cause. Agency is used in three ways, particularly in the New, in the New Testament, it's used three ways. The father is the ultimate cause, and this is denoted by the grammar. It's not denoted by someone's personal theology. The Father is creator. The Son is the agent of creation, so the, the Father is the ultimate agent. The Son is the intermediate agent. That which the ultimate agent uses to carry out the action. That's what we find with the end of the genitive, which you haven't responded to yet. But the Father is the ultimate cause of all things. So if you want to make some doctrine out of the usages of Father, in fact, it's only used Gosh, it's, it's only used several times in the Old Testament, but it's always denoting something about his parental role. It is not teaching Unitarianism, that's for sure. Okay, um, Dr. Delcor, Hebrews 2, 7 cites Psalm 8, 5, and 6 to prove that the Son has been appointed over the works of the Father's hands. Hebrews 2, 7 in the NASB says, You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him, the Son, over the works of your hands. Now, since Hebrews 2.7 is citing Hebrews 5.6, we know that Hebrews 2.7 is showing that the Son is prophesied here. So, Dr. Delcor, according to Psalm 8, 5, and 6, which is cited in Hebrews 2.7, what person has been appointed to rule over the works of his hands? Is it the Son or the Father? Well, if you, again, one, one I think, hermeneutical flaw, uh, Ms. Ritchie, is that you tend to in, interpret the New Testament in light of the Old, and that you would you know, certainly um, get a mark if you were in any basic hermeneutic class. That's not what you do. Again, the son is the intermediate agent of all things. The father, we do believe in the economic trinity. Each person has, as we find in scripture, each person has function. It wasn't the father that died on the cross. It's not the, the, the son who justifies. You quoted um, Romans 8. We know in Romans 8 that it's the Father that declares righteous, and he does so based on the work of the Son, and the Holy Spirit is a regenerator. So we do believe in an, an economical trinity where each person of the trinity has function, but yet they're ontologically co-equal. And none of the arguments in, in, Psalm, in Psalm 8 and... Uh, I, I can't even begin to deal with Hebrews chapter 1, deal with his on ontological identity as God the Son. None of them deal with that. You're talking position. You're confusing position with his ontological position as God. Okay, we're using up all the time. I think we're getting off the topic a little bit. But I'm talking about the scripture in Psalm 8, 5, and 6 in Hebrews 2, 7. 
And it's very clear to me, I, without all the Greek, I started with the New Testament, and I said, quoted Psalm 8, 5, and 6 to show that the Son has been appointed to the rule of the works of the Father's hands, but I don't see an answer quite to that. I'm just saying it's the well, Old I Testament. Said, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. All right. So, so let, me just, let me just formulate a question here. Okay. Um, out of, uh, Emily, just move on because of lack of time because I'm not going to get to this. Matthew 120 says, Joseph, son of David, fear not to take unto you Mary as your wife, for the child which has been conceived in her is, Greek preposition, ek, which you know is out of or from out of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so according to New American Standard Concordance, the Greek preposition ek literally means from out of or out from, and then the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 16, 27, I came out from God. Then in the next verse, he said, I came out from the Father. Uh, so, and then again in John 17, 8, Jesus prayed, I came out from you, addressing the Father. How exactly could the Christ child have been incarnated out of or out from the Holy Spirit, which John 16, 28 and John 17, 8 identifies as the Father? Can we get a direct answer? Sure. If, if, you, if you're familiar with Greek, you would understand this. In, in Matthew 1, uh, 118, you quote Ek. But I, I just wondered if you know the, the case that follows Eck. I'm not, I can't ask you that, but I don't think you know, understand the case, what case it's in that follows. It does matter. The object of the preposition does matter in interpretation. It really does. Grammar is not inconsequential. It's panumatos. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's Eck after the genitive. And in basic Greek grammar, when you have ek after the genitive, like here, like the passage that you're misquoting as out, you have the meaning of by means. I would uh, consult Daniel Wallace on uh, Greek grammar beyond the basics or any standard grammar. It's by means of or through, and it was the Holy Spirit that was the agency of the uh, supernatural event of Mary's uh, pregnancy here. Are you done? Hmm? Okay. Um, Psalm 110.1 says, Yahweh said to my Lord, you know the Hebrew is Adon, which normally, normally stands for human Lord. It doesn't say Yahweh said to Yahweh. Yahweh said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool of your feet. Dr. Delcor, why would God the Father have said to a co-equally distinct Yahweh God the Son, or a God the Word, before the incarnation, sit at my right hand if the Son was already in the Father's presence at his anthropomorphic right hand to begin with? Well, again, Mr. Ritchie, I think you misunderstand the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, number one, we do hold to the economical Trinity. Each person had function before the incarnation, as I demonstrated in, in John 6.38, where the Son actually has his own will, and yet he doesn't do the will of his own, ta'aman. He uses a personal possessive pronoun. He actually owns his will. He doesn't use his own will, he says, but the will of the Father. Now, if you're going to make an ontolo uh, ontological argument, argument of that, you're going to have great difficulties because that is a doctrine of the Trinity. We find a functional subordination between the Father and Son before time, uh, a sarcos. So there's no problem with these verses you're given. It doesn't disprove the pre-existence of the Son. None of these passages disprove the pre-existence of the Son because now you're arguing if he was God or not. We're, this debate is supposed to be about the pre-existence of the Son. None of these passages disprove it. You know, so I'm I don't know okay. what you'll okay. ask next, but uh, Luke 135, the angel responded to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child should be called the Son of God. Romans 1, 4 says the Son was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Uh, so, Dr. Delcourt, can you recite a single Bible verse giving us a reason why the Son is called the Son other than the post-incarnational reason given in Luke 135, Romans 1, 4. We're done? Which are the brothers? I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll answer after, though. <laughs> we can go behind the building. <laughs> okay. Wish we had a longer debate. It would have been so much better. All right. Thank you for your. Thank you, too, sir. Okay. Um, John 1 1. In light of the imperfect tense of Eme, Eme uh, there, um, which grammatically points to a pre existence of the word, at least before um, RK. And in light of John 1, 1, C, where the predicate nominative defines or describes a category, not the person of the subject, can you point to a single passage in the New Testament where prostan theon, aside from where the neuter is used, denoting anything other than distinct persons who were with God? So anything other than distinct persons yeah. who were with God? Could no. you point to a place where it's not involving distinct persons and tantheon? 
where, where it is, it is not. Of where, course, where, that's yeah, my sh point. Show me, yeah, that's where, my where point. it's not showing where it doesn't involve persons, like in the mind or, or an abstract idea or anything else but persons. Because my argument was every single time, except where the neuters use, it shows person. Can you point to one place where it doesn't involve persons, where persons weren't prostantheon? Okay. Okay, I can. Actually, matter of fact, your, your, your question actually supports my position. Uh, because a uh, prostantheon is used 20 times, and you basically said in your videos, every single time that the phrase prostantheon is used, except two, it denotes persons who are with the God, distinct persons. But prostantheon is only translated as with God three times. So the with God is found in John 1, 1, John 1, 2. But then we go to John, I'm sorry, yeah, Romans 15, 1. We have peace with God, prostantheon. Now, we don't actually show persons with another person. That's my point. Prostantheon does not show persons with another person. So prostantheon used in John 1, 1 does not show that there's a distinct God person with the Father literally, but only in his mind and planning. Uh, pertaining to God, prostantheon occurs uh, um, let's see, four times as toward God, toward God, three times as pertaining, as things pertaining to God, three times, things, not persons pertaining to God. So I already answered okay, your question there. Mr. Richard, I said aside from where the neuter articles use. Neuter article. I'm going and it's only, and it's only, the okay. yeah, but, but the neuter article, the, the two to the things, it, and it's three times, not four. Okay, two well, to the things, there's a neuter article, so obviously it's the things okay, pertaining. Okay, so we'll, we'll go on then. And all those verses Besides. that you reference, it has to do with persons. And I got a list of every single things one of them. Do you okay, want well, me to? Well, let me answer your question mm -hmm. now, Dr. Delcor. Okay, you're supposed to have two minutes to answer, okay? So it says against God in one time in Revelation chapter 13, verse 6. Against God is not persons being with God. It says pertaining to God and things three times. It says 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, you turned to God from idols. It doesn't actually show persons that are literally with God. So you made the statement in your videos, and again uh, tonight, that um, every single time except two in one of your videos, four times prostantheon is used, definitely not used, for persons who are with the God in Romans 15, 17, pertaining, things pertaining to God. Hebrews 2, 7, things pertaining to God, Hebrews 5, 1, and things pertaining to God, and in Revelation 13, you, you 6. You keep quoting where the neuter well, articles use. So. I know, but, but you keep quoting where the neuter article. Okay, let me, let me move on. I don't think you understand my question. So, do all, so then all of us then here tonight have to know Greek to rightly divide the word of truth. I don't well, find a Bible verse that shows that we need to learn Greek. No, no, but, but we scholars. have to learn uh, English because you, you make grammatical, like you, you add in the word mind. and Anyways, in light of the conjunction in, in John 6, 38, in light of the conjunction hate, which is a, a, a conjunction that means because, which connects it with verse 37 at the beginning of the sentence, and also the hana purpose and result clause in the middle of the sentence, and in light of the uh, syntactical flow of the pronouns in the previous passages, verse 37, and the personal pronoun ta thalema ta aman, my will, um, in distinction to the will of the Father, uh, is verse 38 a different referential identity than verse 37 and 39? Okay, John 6, 38, you're at, right? Uh -huh. Okay. And in light of the conjunction. Okay, John 6, 38. Uh -huh. Here we go. Okay, well, I know that I can quote the scripture, but I want to get the whole thing in context here. Okay, so verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Now, Jesus is talking now post-incarnationally. God had already became a man. And then he said, I have come down, past tense. He already came down from heaven, so now he's a human being speaking with a human consciousness. I came down from heaven not to do my own will. Now, my opponent is stating that this is a pre-incarnate God will number two opposed to the God will number one. So it could potentially be that there's two and three God wills before the incarnation. Well, I would challenge Dr. Del Coro to okay. cite a single verse where there's two and three God wills before the incarnation. The only okay. thing we find in Scripture after God was manifested in the flesh as a true human being, Emmanuel, God with us, okay. the only time we find a distinct will is after the incarnation when God became a man. Then he said, I came down from heaven because he knew by revelation who he was. John 8, 42 says, I have not even come of my own self, but he sent me. As a human conscious, Jesus didn't make a decision like all human beings. We didn't decide we were going to be born or not. Jesus was so fully human, he could say, I have come down, uh, that he, he said, I have not come on myself, but he sent me. So when he said, I came down from heaven, he was speaking through divine awareness, through revelation from his Father, like I quoted so many scriptures, to show that Jesus did not know all things. He spoke out of a human consciousness when he prayed. If Jesus is God with us as God, 
then how could God with us as God be okay. tempted of evil? Right. So Jesus could not have a uh, distinct God will number two from God will number okay. one. That, that would be a tritheistic conception of God. If we have three God minds and three God wills, where are the passages where God says we and and our, you know, over and over again, we don't find these scriptures where God says, I have three minds, three wills, as three distinct persons. The only time we find post incarnation where the man Christ Jesus had a distinct human will, because he didn't pray to the Father as God number two. He prayed to the Father as a human being, fully human in every way, according to Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 17. Therefore, we know that Jesus is not God the Son, but he is the Son of God and Son of Man, because those incarnational titles are for the man Christ Jesus. And Luke 1, 35 says, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven, and for that reason, he shall be called right, you're, the Son of God. You're deviating God. from this passage, well, No, though. but you took up your time, and you went okay, way off. I know, but it, it, you. So you, you went way off my question, okay. and you, everybody... Hey, Mr. Ritchie, do you, do you understand the semantic uh, relationship between the areas part of participle in this passage and the perfect indicative katababeka? Well, you know, basically what you're saying that, you know, if, you, if you're making these points in Greek, then, then you should be able to cite Well, you, you, said, you, love no, no, you said you love studying. Yeah, but you know what? You should be able to cite well, yes. translations from the Greek text... Right. And you should be able to say in okay. Greek, because I've heard you on your video saying right. you don't need to turn to the Greek. The divinity of Christ is clear enough. We don't need to know Greek. So basically, the whole audience, guys, ladies and gentlemen, that's you all right, have, that, hold on, sir. I did not, excuse. Hold on. I did not interrupt you. I gave you the full two minutes. I kind of shook my head a few times. I gave you the full two minutes, and you're not giving me the full two minutes. And I would ask the moderator, please help me on this. You know, you should not interrupt me. Uh, you know, so I'll let me have my, my two minutes worth. So it's very clear that Jesus Christ is the son of God, son of man, because he's the virgin daughter of a man. We don't have a God, the son of man up in heaven. That's ridiculous. So when Jesus prayed, not my will, I have come down from heaven, because he knew after the incarnation his true identity. That's why he said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Before Abraham was, I am, and so forth. But when he spoke these words, according to Dr. Daniel Seagraves, he said everything that Jesus did and said, he did and said as who he was, God manifest as a genuine human being in genuine and full human existence. This is the teachings of oneness Pentecostals. We do not teach that Jesus is God the Father, with us is God the Father. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, again, the, the exegesis of... Oh, okay. Oh, that's all. Okay. That's too fast. Thanks, I would love to have a better Thank, longer debate. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Thank you, sir. All right, gentlemen, we move to our last phase of the debate, and that is an eight-minute closing statement from each of you. Okay, give me a second here. Sorry. I'm having fun studying the Word of God. I love to share the Word of God. Isn't it fun? That's, that's my reason why I'm here. That, that's the reason for our short lives, to, is to serve God, to worship Him. And I love sharing the word of God, and I thank you again, uh, Agape Christian Center, for uh, hosting this debate. Okay, um, I basically, I can't believe, I mean, I'm looking at my presentation, my 20-minute presentation. He keeps challenging me, but I didn't see a rebuttal. I'm looking for poor, put P for poor, poor responses. He didn't rebut basically anything I said in my 20-minute opening statements. I presented the scriptural evidence that the Father alone is the only true God. We heard nothing from that. I said that the God the Father is used 30 times or more. Didn't hear any rud bottle for that. The Father possesses his own logos. Okay. I shared uh, Revelation 19, 13, that Jesus is the logos of God the Father. He is not a God the Word person. He's the Father's logos. And I shared Origins commentary of the book, book, uh, Gospel of John, book 123, where the early ancient molests were the general run of Christians. Tertullian also said the same thing. They that always make up the majority of believers reject his economic trinity doctrine. And by the way, Tertullian didn't believe that Jesus timelessly existed. He wrote in Hermogenes chapter 3 that there was a time when there was neither sin nor a son. So he was an Arian, was a tr Trinitarian. But I want to go off, off the topic here. But I I'm looking at, look at all that I, I presented I, I cited Galatians 2.5, so the truth of the gospel may stay with you to show that pros does not mean a relationship with, because the Galatians could not have a relationship with the message of the gospel, the truth of the gospel. Certainly pros doesn't mean a relationship with, like so many Trinitarian scholars say. Just like general evolutionists who believe in evolution, they distort the evidence of the scientific data 
to pervert the minds of the masses to try to make you believe we came from monkeys. So likewise, many Trinitarian scholars, like Dr. Delcor, takes the Greek grammar, and we're all looking at him, what is he talking about, the neuter, singular, and this old man? You know? But they take all the scientific, they take the Greek grammar, and it's my belief that they twist that. And I can show that right now. It's a good time. I, I'm looking at my whole debate. I challenge our audience. I cited John 12, 44, 45, John 14, 8, 9, John 10, 37. All these scriptures I don't see rebuttal to. But let, since I have short time, let me just share a few things that Dr. Delcour said. And uh, Philippians 2. Uh, Many Trinitarian scholars disagree with Dr. Delcor's false assertion that Jesus was always in the form of God in heaven before emptying himself in the incarnation. Greek scholar Dr. McNeil wrote, and I quote, in this case, the Aorisk in Echinosin, he emptied himself, does not refer to a single moment of incarnation, but the completeness of a series of repeated acts. Hold on a second. His earthly life, looked at as a whole, was in a failing process of self-emptying. End quote. Dr. Jerome Murphy O'Connor wrote, We have here an emptying related directly to the terrestrial or earthly condition of Christ. Again, Trinitarian theologian Dan Music of Wheaton College Graduate School wrote, Would it make any sense for Paul to state that Christ as God did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped since he was already God? Is the idea of regarding equality with God a thing to be grasped a sensible issue to raise? It is only as a man that Christ did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. As man, Christ emptied himself. End quote. So we have evidence here from Greek scholars that this is not what Dr. Delcor, it's against what Dr. Delcor is saying in Philippians 2 6. Dr. Delcor misquoted John 17 5. The glory which I share with you. Uh, Matthew 6.10 says that Jesus instructed his disciples to pray, saying, Your kingdom come, your will be done. The verb translated as come and be done are also in the Aorus imperative mood. Are Christians commanded to pray or command God in prayer? Certainly not. This destroys Dr. Doug Corr's entire argument. And then he said in his videos, only God can command God. We know that Dr. Doug Corr's arguments from Greek could not be correct. Only God can man God, and then we find scripture, A.R.S. and Paradigm mode, same thing for Christians praying. Again, uh, Dr. Del Cora stated, Prostathian, in, uh, tonight at 1058, into his video titled The Incarnation of the Son of God, which he basically repeated the same thing tonight. Every single time that the phrase Prostathian is used, except two times, it denotes persons who are with the God, distinct persons. But prostatia is also translated as, as God three times. I think I covered this already, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But as you can see, Dr. Del Cor is not right in everything he says. You know, just like you can't trust general evolutionists. Everything they say, because we don't know Greek, it's easy to see the hearts of the audience. So we need to look and study for ourselves. I'm not against studying Greek, but I believe that we need to just look at the natural reading of the text, beloved, because the Greek scholars gave us our translation. We don't have to know Greek to know that there's only one God who became one man to save his people from this. Sin. Adding the words three persons, three minds, three wills. Well, if I can't find script, then don't give me a lip. I don't want to hear your lip unless you give me script. By quoting Greek theologians, you're not actually answering any of the biblical data. And so going back to my original presentation, uh, we find Jeremiah 23, 5 and 6. I'll raise unto David a righteous branch, and the king shall reign. And this is the name whereby he shall be called Yahweh. Not that he has always been called Yahweh. Therefore, the son, since he's not always called Yahweh, that means the name of the Father was given to him. Jesus prayed in John 17, Holy Father, keep the through your name, the name which you have given me. Jesus should have always possessed the name of Yahweh. If he was a timeless God, the son, person. Did we hear any rebuttal to all these statements? I cited John 14, 8, 9. He said, he that has seen, he has seen the Father. John 10, 37, 8. I do the works of my Father. He didn't say, I do the works of a God the Word or a God the Son. Jesus did the works of the Father because he is God incarnate as the Father. Jesus raised his own body from the dead, John 2, 19. Jesus poured out the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Luke 24, 47, Matthew 1, uh, 3, 1, I believe it is. 
So since Jesus baptized with the Holy Spirit, since Jesus raised his own body from the dead, he did the works of God the Father. He didn't do the works of God the Son. And I cited John 12, 44, 45, where Jesus said, he who believes in me doesn't believe on me, but him who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. Where is the divine dignity and believability of a God the Son person? Jesus, as a man, was exalting his Father. Why? Because the Father is the only true God. Do we hear John 17, 3? Where Jesus said, you are the only true God? We heard no response from Dr. Del Cor. I can go on and on. I should, I should that Jesus always spoke the logos of God the Father. John 17, 17. John 14, 24. Revelation 19, 13 calls Jesus the word, the logos of God the Father. I shared origins uh, belief or teaching about the early Christians who were the majority or the general of Christians and they said that what is the Son of God when called the Word? They, the moralists, the oneness, say that he is the utterance of the Father deposited in words, the Logos. The Messianic prophecies. I will be him a Father. He will be the way a Son. Del Cor, Dr. Del Cor, never responded to these verses of Scripture. I can go home right now. I will be. To him a Father. He will be to be a son. Now, we're not denying the divinity of Jesus. No, sir. No, ma'am. We believe that Jesus Christ is Emmanuel, God with us, is a man. So God became a man. Right. That shows the distinction between the Father and the Son. God bless you all. Love you all. In the Lord in Jesus' name. As I said at the very beginning, my job is to affirm. His job is to repeat what I was saying. He's wondering why I never respond to his Unitarian passages. There's only one God and so on and so forth. Well, because that's not my job tonight. My job tonight was to affirm the pre-existence of Christ. It's interesting, I, I told you about bit and piece people. He quotes bits and pieces from Trinitarian scholars who have a different view on the participles and the verbs in Philippians 2.6, not completely ignoring the vast amount of scholarship on Philippians 2.6. These were Trinitarians. With whatever view, Raymond has a view that it was an Adam Christ um, presentation there. So what? It doesn't refute what I'm saying. I gave text after text, and I gave you the exegesis of these texts, and I didn't hear anything. The one that's Unitarian doctrine that Mr. Ritchie embraces is a different Christ, a different gospel, as you heard. Because if he would have just followed the English and not go to the Greek, he wouldn't be a one that's gospel. Because you wouldn't have to add the word mind into every passage that simply says Christ created all, the Son created all things through Him, to Panta, through Him. You wouldn't have to do that. If you just rely on the English, you can go to Hebrews 1.10. It simply says, God the Father said to the Son, verse 8, about the Son, the Father addressed the Son as the Lord of Psalm 102. He wouldn't need to go to the Greek if he was just allowed the text to read for itself. I asked you the passages. He didn't. He didn't respond to anything. And everyone could see that I was the one that went step by step from evidence to conclusion, establishing the very little amount of time that I had, establishing those some exegesis of the important text. Uh, in John 6.38, he just gives the excuse, well, you know, I don't, I don't need to go to Greek. Well, then why tell me you like to study? You like to study secondhand information, biblical translations, and then read into a one is Unitarian theology. That's what you like to do. Don't tell us you like to study. That requires going to the original language, going to the infallibility of the authors who said Jesus was sent to earth, Apatu Morano, <coughs> sent to earth. He came down, sent to earth. But this was after the Father sent him. After the actually the Aries participle. It was, it was then, before he came to earth, that he says, not my will, but the one who sent me. Mr. Richard says, oh, I don't know any place that talks about will. Just read the passage. You'll see that Jesus has his own will before he came to earth. And it's distinct from the Father. Mr. Richie did not respond to Hain cross on Leon. He's still appealing to the neuter at examples and going just everywhere but the passage. Everywhere but the 20 places where persons are involved. Mr. Rich never responded to the son as the monogamous theos ha'om. He never responded to the articulate participle that denotes existing always or subsisting who is always at the Father's bosom. 
He never responded to that. All he quoted was irrelevant uh, passages, not in these contexts. Would he do the same thing in Revelation 1 8, the Lord Almighty, the Alpha and Omega, the Lord Almighty, ha oh, who is always? Would he say, well, that doesn't mean always? Really? Would he do that in Revelation 1 4? Or all the other places where it's applied to God? I've made my case tonight. I've made my case. I've done my job. My opponent's Unitarian Nestorian kind of theology, whatever you want to call it, is sharply refuted and demolished by the biblical text that I presented. He didn't refute anything. He just kept going to other passages that had no, absolutely no relevance. What does Tertullian have to do with this argument? I don't know. The, the Council of Nicaea. You know, let's talk about the special they're having in Norm's Diner. I mean, who stay relevant? He hasn't. I made my case. God was glorified tonight. Mr. Richie went to default mode, presenting nothing more than Unitarian precepts. So he says, one God. There's no, that, that has nothing to do with the precepts of the Son. The debate tonight. I would say Mr. Richie lost this debate. Not because he's, he's, not because he's a deficient in speaking, right? I think he's a good speaker. Not because of that. But rather, I think he lost this debate because he didn't do his job. He knew his job when we first started to refute me, to refute the exegesis of the pre existence of God the Son. He didn't do that. He just get, I mean, the, going to the Old Testament to talk about the Father in, in creation. What is that have to do with the subject? He didn't do his job of providing any kind of meaningful refutation to what I presented. In other words, I don't think Mr. Richie was prepared. Just so. He, wants, he knows the passages. He wasn't prepared to interact with the acts of Jesus. Not at all. One is Christology presents a decidedly different Christ, as you heard tonight. Scripture presents Jesus Christ as impersonal, distinct from the Father, distinct from God the Holy Spirit. It affirms, as the biblical authors affirm, that the one who was sent by the Father was God who was sent by the Father, ectu rano. I pointed out 40 times, Jesus said, I was sent by my Father. You don't have to go to Greek to understand that. Kids know this and go to youth camp. Jesus was sent by another. John 17, 5, there was nothing. He just, he didn't, there was no interaction with, there, with that text. Jesus said, glorify me, Father. With the glory I share, yes, I share. Do your linguistic homework on the word. It's an imperfect verb there. Parasa alto, followed by the imperfect verb. Parasa alto, intimate fellow or fellowship there. Side by side, in association, it's used twice there. Why do I say share? Because execute the passage. The glory I had, I you can use any word you want. Use the NASB. It doesn't matter. He had glory. When did he have this glory? When did he possess this glory? Pratutankasman. Before the foundation of the world. Just like it says in the English. Who did he have it with? It says parasoi. That's the ending prepositional phrase. Parasoi. Pratutankasman and I. With who? Parasoi. First John 2. 22 and 23, the apostle says, Who is the liar? It's the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. The one who denies the Father and the Son, whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son also has the Father. And John goes on in 2 John 1 9, anyone who does, who goes too far and does not abide in the teachings of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in this teaching has both Tapatra, the Father, and the Son. Grammatical construction, two distinct persons. Your English communicates that. If you don't believe in the Father and Son as a saint, you don't have God. Along with the angels, I do worship the Son. I don't ask why. He commanded the angels to worship the Son, and they worship the Son because He's God. For tonight's topic is, is essential to Christian faith. John 8 24 again. It's the Son who said there's someone else who testifies on my behalf. In the same chapter, 17 and 18. The Son said this, unless you believe that you go and me, that I am will die in your sins. Then he says in verse 28, when you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the eternal one. You go and me. And the Jews wanted to kill him. This was Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, who said before Abraham sprang to existence, I am God. Woo! So this brings us to the conclusion of our debate. First, I, I want to thank
head be the audience for not becoming part of the debate. That happens sometimes. But mm -hmm. thank you for not doing that. Um, second, I want you to know that, that both of our debaters have material outside, and they both have tables uh, for you to, to look at that. Now, we do have an event starting here shortly after, so we need to exit the building. Uh, so while this debate can continue, and of course it cannot continue in the sanctuary we're here because there is another event here. And I want to thank both of our debaters uh, very much, and I, and I hope uh, you appreciated it. I truly appreciate it. Thank you very much.